Previously, in episode 1, we visited perhaps the world's most famous prehistoric monument, had a look at one of Britain's finest medieval cathedrals, learnt about the Roundheads and Cavaliers, We're at Castle. and dropped in to see the very famous Sammy Miller's Motorcycle Museum before heading off to our final destination of the Lazy Lion Inn in Milford-on-Sea. So this is our uh, accommodation for the night, the Lazy Lion. Let's go, let's go and check out our room. And here we are, room five. Yeah, it's very kind of boutique-ish, isn't it? Mm, lovely, it looks like it's been refurbished and it's bright. Spacious. Lots of windows. Lovely, but... mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it looks okay. We now need to check out beer o'clock and food and we're good to go. There we are at the menu. Well, folks, we had a great day's riding and we're here at Milford-on-Sea. It's a very lovely, peaceful place. Milford-on-Sea is a traditional village and part of the New Forest National Park, and you get some spectacular views across to the Isle of Wight and the Needles. Well, not surprisingly, all this sightseeing has given me a bit of a thirst. Yes folks, I'm drinking a pint of piddle. So, back to the Lazy Lion for dinner. To start with, we're sharing Asian duck skewers. I'm not sure it's going to fill us up, but it's just a taste. Thank you so much. And you can have my mushy piece. Oh, mushy peas. Excellent. It can't get better than this. So if you're staying in Milford-on-Sea, how would we rate the Lazy Lion Inn? The Lazy Lion Inn is a pub and restaurant right in the centre of the seaside town Milford-on-Sea and a five-minute walk to the Pebble Beach. There are a couple of other places to eat nearby, including Real Ale across the road. I can imagine a little town would be heaving with tourists in peak season, but it was relatively quiet when we arrived in mid-October. Our room was lovely and looked as though it had been newly decorated. It was very spacious with a big bed, three large windows and plenty of storage space. The ensuite shower room was also refurbished and was large and modern with a powerful electric shower. Having wandered around the town, we opted to eat in the hotel. The Lazy Line is clearly a popular place to eat and offered the usual pubby style food, fish and chips, bangers and mash, etc., which were actually pretty good. The beer, however, I am reliably informed, was poor in both choice and quality. The breakfast was included in the price and the menu offered all the usual hot items. But if your preference is for continental like me, the choice is limited to cornflakes and toast, which was a bit disappointing. The staff were friendly and helpful, but we did notice that all the pubs and restaurants in the area were still insisting on table service only, one-way systems and a preference for face coverings, and a continuing COVID measures certainly slowed the service down and made it less than atmospheric and enjoyable. With any luck, that'll all be over by the next holiday season. 
There is a small gravel car park at the rear of the property. It was secure and safe, but we were glad we got there early as there really isn't a lot of space. It may be because of the proximity to the sea, but the lazy line wasn't a cheap option. And compared with some of the other places we've stayed, we felt it was overpriced. Today we leave the sleepy little town of Milford-on-Sea and continue our trip today around some of the delightful villages and towns of the New Forest. So let's check in later on. Today we're going to have a pleasant day meandering through the beautiful towns and villages of the spectacular New Forest. Starting off with a visit to the unique historic village of Buckler's Hard. And then make our way through Brockenhurst, Lyndhurst and Ringwood to our final destination, little town of Fordingbridge. But first we wanted to visit Hurst Castle that stands magnificently at the end of a long narrow spit that extends one and a half miles from Milford-on-Sea. And so the options are one and a half mile walk in all your biking gear or take the local ferry. Naturally, we opted for the short five minute ride to the quaint little Keyhaven Ferry. So today, this morning, we're going to Hurst Castle. Right, we're not riding there, we're going by boat. Henrietta Rose. This is Captain Tony. Hello. How long is the crossing to the castle? 10 minutes, 12 minutes, that's Ten. it. First run of the day? No, no, I've already taken down the staff for the castle. Oh, okay. And we have another boat at the other end. Oh, I see, so, so you we'll cross over. We're swapping ends as we, as we get passengers. So we're off.
Hurst Castle is situated at the end of a shingle spit that extends one and a half miles from Milford on sea. The end of the spit was only three quarters of a mile from the Isle of Wight. It was built by Henry VIII as one of a chain of coastal fortresses and was completed in 1544. The castle was modernised during the Napoleonic Wars and again in the 1870s. Two of the huge 38-ton guns installed in the 1870s can still be seen. The original castle was built to protect the key ports and landing places around southern England from continental attack. It was sited to guard the Needles Passage, the narrow western entrance to the Solent and gateway to the trading port of Southampton and the new naval base at Portsmouth. King Charles I was imprisoned here in the winter of 1648. He arrived by boat at the castle under parliamentary guard from the Isle of Wight. He was held in the keep, probably on the first floor, from the 1st to the 19th of December. So he had about 18 days locked up in a cold castle, allowed to walk down the spit every day for exercise until he was taken to London for his trial and execution on the 19th of December. In 1700, Hearst was again used as a secure prison, this time to hold anyone convicted for spreading the Catholic faith. In the event, only one prisoner was sent here, Father Paul Atkinson, who remained in the castle for 30 years until his death at the age of 74. In both world wars, the castle once again played a key role in protecting the western entrance to the Solent. So that was Hearst Castle, folks. Not really a castle, more like a, a fort. And interesting place, but unfortunately we couldn't get to see all of it because it's been renovated and the walls fallen down. But it was definitely worth a trip, wasn't it? It was a nice boat trip. <laughs> I think it, if you've been to some of the other castles that we've been to, seen the history, I guess, it feels more like a, a military building, barracks, than it does a castle. Yeah. But yeah, it's good to have seen it. Not the best castle we've seen, but you can't pass these places and not take a look. And now we're back on the road with a tour of the villages of the New Forest.
horses for many years before trading four legs for two wheels, so it was lovely to see all the ponies in the new forest. I'd actually always thought they were wild, but apparently they're all owned by locals called commoners, who have the right to graze not just ponies, but cattle and pigs throughout the year. We were out on the beach, covered in the Buckley's Hard is a unique 18th century village where the warships for Nelson's navy were built. Brooklyn's Hard is one of England's most attractive and unusual villages. It was created in the early 18th century by the second Duke of Montague. Originally founded as a free port for the trading of sugar, Brooklyn's Hard actually flourished as a naval shipbuilding centre and it's become famous for building the warships for Nelson's navy, including three that took part in the Battle of Trafalgar. During the Second World War, it became a motor torpedo base, and further downstream, sections of the Mulberry Harbours were constructed in preparation for the D-Day landings. And if you want to take a step back in time, you can walk through the recreation of the shipwright's cottage. It just reminds me of Blackburn when I was a kid.
speed limit throughout the New Forest is limited to 40 miles an hour, which is absolutely perfect so you can enjoy the magnificence of the countryside you're riding through. Brockenhurst is the largest village by population in the New Forest and has officially been named the most beautiful place to live in the UK. Lindhurst has been the unofficial capital of the New Forest since William the Conqueror established the area as a royal hunting ground in 1079. It's also the burial place of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. Minstead still has some original stocks, where criminals were punished for things like swearing and drunkenness. Local people would throw rotten food or even stones at them. Stocks in the pillar were used as punishment throughout the 16th and 17th century. Fordingbridge is a small riverside town known as the Northern Gateway to the New Forest. It's built on the banks of the River Avon and a key landmark of the town is the medieval bridge which we've just crossed over. It looked like an interesting place to stay but sadly our hotel was a couple of miles outside Fordingbridge so we're heading for the railway hotel. Check out our accommodation. Yeah, which is great. And look at this. We've got our own little kind of 
you describe it? Like a reception a area? Yeah, a little sitting area. Sitting area? With tea and coffee facilities. And tea and coffee and, and TV. And you only get in if you have a boarding pass. Yeah. So. And this is the bedroom. Looks really clean. In fact, the whole place looks recently refurbished. It's great if you love trains. Who doesn't love a steam train? Yeah, lovely, clean, fresh bathroom. Again, quirky design. So far, so good. What do you reckon? Really lovely, excellent. Yeah. Just gonna check the beer out later on and the food. Yeah, but this is looking really good. The Railway Hotel is a boutique hotel, restaurant and bar. Originally opened in the 1860s by Eldridge Pope, who was a Dorchester brewer. It served Fording Bridge Railway Station, one of the stops on the newly built Salisbury and Dorset Railway, and it's been beautifully restored to its elegant Victorian best. There are five ensuite rooms, all named after famous trains, including the Orient Express, the Bournemouth Bell, and the one we were staying in, which was the Flying Scotsman. And if you can make it with a nice big creamy head on it, that'll be even better. Thank you. <laughs> Local brewer, isn't it, Ringwood Brewery? The, the Ringwood Brewery is here, basically. This, this is the Boondon. It's a Boondon, yeah. Uh, While we were in Fording Bridge, we met up with our lovely friend Joe. It's rare that we get to see friends on our travels, but Jo lives locally and it was really great to catch up with her over dinner. When you went on your trip, you learned to speak Spanish, didn't you? Or a little bit of Spanish? I learned a bit, a bit of Spanish because I had to. In South America, there was no... Yes, it's quite difficult over there. Anyway, your English is very good. Thank you so much. There you are, see? Bacon butty, bacon and egg, toast and a great... Great service. Great service. service here. Can't fault it. Railway Hotel is about a mile out of the small town of Fording Bridge. It's very easy to find on the main station road. There's five rooms, all named after famous trains, as well as a separate self-contained cottage. Our room was the Flying Scotsman and had a comfortable lounge area with a sofa and a second TV, as well as a bright, modern and sparkling clean bedroom and ensuite shower room. We've noticed as we've continued our travels that it's the little touches that make a difference and things like tea and coffee facilities and complimentary bottled water are really nice additions for us. This hotel had those. We don't usually mind a stroll to find a pub and restaurant in the evenings but didn't fancy a two mile return walk that night and the hotel's menu and choice of beer for Bry were great so we had pre-dinner drinks in the buffet car and dining in the dining carriage. Yep. The railway theme continued throughout the hotel. The food was very good and pretty reasonably priced and breakfast was lovely too. The service was truly exceptional with every member of staff we met being very keen for us to have the best experience. Teo, who we met at breakfast, really needs a special mention for brightening our morning. Parking won't ever be a problem no matter what time you arrive at this hotel. The car park is very large and well tarmacked and as Fording Bridge is a small, safe town, we felt pretty comfortable that the bikes were secure. It's a really lovely, quirky place, and we had a great stay. If you do decide to visit, call direct, ask for Diane, and mention MMD, and you'll get a special rate. 